Good morning to you. I'd like to make one little edit. Oh, that's going to load me. There we go. Not really like to smile, I like to move around. Probably because I have ADHD and I just can't stand still. I hope that makes for an exciting lesson for you. Anyway, not only do I have black hair with a big smile, I think I have big black hair with a big smile. And uh, I actually got a haircut about a week ago, but before then, I mean, this fro was just huge. It's pulling down between the lower of my eyes. It was out of control. So I'm glad I have that under control for you all. Uh, another thing about us, I was asked if I played for Madison Central, and I did. When I was in high school, I played basketball there for four years, and it was great. We weren't nearly as good as this last year's team was. Of course, if you keep up with high school basketball, Madison Central had just won the state tournament. Last second three, there was a steal at half court, got it in the corner, jump shot over a double team. It was beautiful. Drain the three, it was awesome. And of course, that was in one arena. And the state tournament, if you've ever had a chance to go, is a great joy. I played when I was a junior on Saturday. I was that like 30 second guy on the team at the end of the bench that was holding the water for everybody else. And I got in the last few seconds of the game, and I had a chance to shoot a, a three. And I got the ball at the top of the key, and I was going to shoot, and I was like, oh, yeah, this is money. I'm 10,000 people. Come on. And I, I shot it, and I thought it was going to go in because you always got to think every shot's going to go in. And the shot just barely nipped the front of the ground, and I'm so thankful for that. That not be an air ball from 10,000 people. But it nipped the front of the rim, and you know, I didn't care. Because I, I was on rough range court, the big UK was right there, I missed the shot, and I turned around and smiled, I was like, oh, like, who cares, it's awesome. And that's why I didn't play much, because I was just obsessed with things I did not really play basketball. So, rough arena is uh, pretty important to me. As a matter of fact, it's important not just to me, but to my wife. She does pull for Alabama in football, but has been a lifelong Kentucky fan. Pretty cool stuff. I married the right one. And we got to go to a UK game, I think it's been two years at this point ago. And Brian had never had a chance to go to our game. So my father, my mother, myself, and my wife, all sitting up and rubbering. And if you've ever been before, you know how to start on this spot. Lights go off. Music comes on. Starting point guard. Whatever. It's incredible. People are going nuts. At the very end, after all five starters have, <laughs> after all five starters have been called, that thing <laughs> happens. Confetti flies up over the rim, lights go everywhere. And I look over my wife, and she has tears coming down her face. I was like, I definitely married the right one. <laughs> she loves him too. And that's just the neat thing. Uh, rum arena. Woo, I love it. In honor of that arena. We're going to discuss two different arenas this morning. I got this from Dan Winkler. Our minds are on a rope arena at this moment, but in just a few seconds, I want us to take our minds to another arena. The first arena that we will be discussing is the arena of interpretation. We're going to look to the text of Haggai chapter 1, but before then we're going to lay some groundwork in the book of Ezra. And we're going to interpret that text in the arena of interpretation. And after going to that arena and really exhausting it, we're going to move over into the another arena that I like to call application. So we're going to interpret what the text says. We're going to move into another arena this morning in the arena of application. That's where we're going to make some points about our life. How does the Bible affect us on a daily basis? We coined the phrase... What's the bottom line? Because when it comes to studying the Bible, when you're really getting down to the nitty gritty, you ask the question, what's the bottom line? I've got to meet some people in sales this morning, and I'm sure as, as they're discussing sales, they're in one seat, the buyer's in the other seat. I'm sure the buyer, after asking all those questions, after finding out this information, they're like, all right, let's get to the bottom line here. How much is it going to cost me? Buying a car, you've been there before. All right, bottom line, what's the price? 
That's the important part, right? We're going to discuss this morning the bottom line. I believe the bottom line when it comes to the Bible is serving the Lord. Period. What's the bottom line? Serve the Lord. How should I live my life? Serving the Lord. What should I help other people try to do? Serve the Lord. What's the bottom line? There you go. Sermon over. Of course not. You've got to go to those arenas, right? This morning, I've entitled the lesson, Consider Your Ways. And this is not Ralphie from Christmas Story. It's just some picture I found. And so here we are. Consider Your Ways over in Haggai chapter 1. But first, let's go to Ezra chapter 1. We're going to enter into that arena of interpretation. And while there, I want to lay some groundwork for our study this morning. In Ezra chapter 1, through Ezra chapter 4, verse 24, we're going to find four points of consideration. But let's lay some groundwork first. In Ezra chapter 1, we see that Israel was taken captive. Once again, we find the Israelites losing faith, losing their way, losing a relationship with God, whatever the case may be, God says, okay, I'm going to make some other pagan nation come over, take you captive, and you're going to put in slavery until you learn how to act. And you see that in 2 Chronicles 36, just on the next page over my Bible, in verses 17 down to verse 21. You see that Jerusalem was burned to the ground. The holy temple that David had prepared, that Solomon finished, burned, was killed. And then over in Ezra chapter 1, you see by who? Well, the Persian king Cyrus. Now before you get your minds gone on slavery and captivity, I want you to know that this king Cyrus was actually a peaceful guy. Yes, he burned Jerusalem to the ground. But he was a peaceful person. And you'll find in, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, that Cyrus actually allowed the Israelites to go back home. I conquered you as a people, and you will honor me as king, but go ahead and go back home. You can go back to Jerusalem. Go back to your homeland. As a matter of fact, he said, go back to your homeland and rebuild the temple that we destroyed. Pretty good guy. He's a peaceful conqueror. And so that's what we find in Ezra 1, verses 1 through 4. Look over at Ezra chapter 3. In Ezra 2, you see all the people who return back to Jerusalem. And in Ezra 3, the Israelites, they made their way to Jerusalem. They're back home. And it's time to start building again. Ezra chapter 3, verse 7. So they gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and Tyrrhenians. Bringing cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa. In other words, they're getting it going. It's time to lay this foundation for the temple of their God. Number one, it's their duty from God. But secondly, it's their duty from the king. So they're beginning to make arrangements to lay the groundwork to lay the foundation of God's temple. Over in verses 10 and 11, it's complete. Verse 10, the builders lay the foundation of the temple. And then the ceremony begins. Because this is a wonderful thing. The priests in their vestments come forward with trumpets. And the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the direction of David, king of Israel. It's a celebration. When Mass and Central won the state tournament, as they were coming home, the streets of Richmond were lined with people. And everywhere it was swarming. Fire trucks were going crazy. Police sirens were going off. People were playing music there, screaming and yelling. The foundation of the temple had just been finished. The foundation of the temple that God Himself will dwell in, that daily offerings will be made in, where priests will make their ministry in on a daily basis. It's been laid and people are overjoyed. They're excited about it. Symbols are playing. Music is going. People are yelling, verse 11, shouting. And the Bible says, verse 11, and they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And 
it's a great day. Number one, they're fulfilling their, their God-given duty to build the temple, but they're also doing what the king told them to do. And so the temple foundation was laid. And then in Ezra chapter 4, we find some people that weren't so excited about this temple. In the arena of interpretation, let's look at Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Because while, yes, the Israelites were building the temple, they were happy and they were excited. Their neighbors couldn't stand it. The neighbors asked to help out. You know, like any good neighbor, here's a pumpkin pie, here's an apple pie. Welcome, we're your neighbors. Well, they tried to come over and give aid to the Israelites. But the Israelites said, no, we don't want it. It's our duty to build this temple. You go home. They didn't like that. Look at Ezra chapter 4, verse 4 with me. Then the people of the land, the neighbors, discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus and of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Well, yeah, it made the Israelites happy. But make their neighbors a little upset. No, not just a little, a lot upset. They were bribing people to give them to stop. They were forcing them, probably fighting, probably killing, kidnapping. We don't know the extent that they went as they were discussing with Israel. But we know that they probably dealt harshly with Israel. And so these people were angered. And it didn't just stop the people. It went all the way up to the top. All the way to the king. Look at Ezra 4 in verse 17. The king sent answer. A.K.A. he wrote a letter. I won't read his letter because of time. But 17 down in verse 22 is the letter that he wrote about Israel building that temple. Verse 23. Then, when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai, the scribe and their associates, Notice this. They went in haste to the Jews in Jerusalem and by force and power they did stop. By force and power the Israelites were forced to stop building the temple of their God. Was it by force and power from God? No. From the king. Consideration number one in this arena of interpretation Israel allowed their hearts to grow weak. I made this point a couple of times. Let me say it again. It was Israel's duty from God to build the temple. Yes, the king gave them permission, gave them an order, but it was first an order from God. And when the king came in and said, no more, cut the building off. The foundation is laid, but I don't want any more to be done. Israel, no. They allowed their hearts to grow weak. From the reign of Cyrus all the way to the reign of Darius, they quit building the temple. We think that's about 17 years. That's some girl's lifetime. They ceased building the temple of God. The place where ministers, the priests, would come and offer sacrifices. The place where people in the community would come and, and get forgiveness of sins and offer up praise offerings and food offerings and all the types of offerings. Basically, it's the central focus of the town. But because a king said no, they stopped. And their hearts grew weak. Consideration number two. Israel allowed other people to dictate their level of spirituality. In the arena of interpretation, I want you to see from the text that it wasn't God that made them stop building. God had given them an assignment of building a temple, keeping a place for His Spirit to dwell, and they let a king's orders stop them. Their heart grew weak, and they let someone else dictate their level.